Buckle your swash and jolly your roger for the funniest rock and rollicking adventure ever. Hello, sailor. And welcome to oh, Review It Yourself. Defend It Yourself 17. Don't know how we've got that far in. And today is probably one of the probably one of the best we've done. I've really enjoyed this one. It's the pirate movie, the 1982 film, which I'd never even heard of, never crossed my radar, didn't have a clue. It was recommended to me by Jason from It's Not That Bad podcast. And he's here to join me. Welcome, Jason. Thanks for thank you very much. Oh, dude, thank you so much for bringing me on. I have been, you know, we're kind of in the same boat when it comes to our podcast. We'll sit there and we will defend movies, you know, with our swords and cannons and whatever we need to defend them with. This has been a movie where I remember watching this ad nauseum when it was on you know, the, the, the movie channels when I was growing up, it was on, uh, I think it was first choice and super channel here in Canada. And this movie was on constantly probably because it was good family friendly fun. Uh, you can put this on at any time of day and there was just something so infectiously fun about this film. And when you realize just how much the critics pick this thing apart, it's like, no, 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 we don't mess with the pirate movie. Do you know what though? Sometimes for me, especially nowadays, and I won't I'll try not to go too much into modern day, but if if the critics rip it to pieces and a couple of YouTubers or a couple of podcasters that I listen to and I kind of trust their opinion and I'm generally with them, go, you know what, this is this is decent this. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'll go and see this. I think if anything, like critics now, it's like, oh what you say what you want. If if they pan a film. I'm like, oh, that might be worth going to see. Whereas if they go, oh my god, this is this is the best film. I mean, I I swear this is true. I drove past a bus stop today that had a poster of the Flash. That let's face it, no one cares about the Flash. We're just going for Keaton's Batman. If you're going to go at all, I'm not going to bother. But it had on the top of it in big block capitals like the the one of the best superhero movies ever. I was like, no, 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 no. Let's just can we just can we just can we just no. Just, I don't believe you. I physically just don't believe you. So I just, yeah, I'm. I like you. I'm. I'm not sold on. If a critic tells me it's like the best thing since sliced bread, I'm going. Yeah, I'm not sure because I, I have some films I absolutely love. Batman and Robin being one of them for various reasons, and it's. I know how bad it is, but if you, you tell me, like sometimes you just want a good time, which is a good segue back to this film, because oh, I just I absolutely love the. Spoiler alert for anybody listening. There's not going to be much defending from Jason on this because I'll probably defend it <laughs> most, <laughs> more than him. Um, yeah. So a quick disclaimer, which is not something I usually do, but you know, before anyone starts banging on about how this film is problematic, I can't stand that word, uh, with its hilarious men versus women narrative, goofy depictions of pirates, jokiness of pillaging, can I can I just remind you all of something? And I'm not trying to patronize you. I'm really not. But it's not real. It's not real. <laughs> it's not real. You're not meant to watch it and take it as some kind of societal commentary. It's not real. It's stupid. It's daft. Yes, there's loads of insults towards women, which are hilarious. But the biggest insult, the biggest joke of them all, is that the main character in it is the most intelligent one, and he's just like, yes, yeah, you you carry on. That that's the whole joke. But sorry, go on, Jess. <laughs> I, I I think there's there is something to be said there though about the time that the film was made in. The the film was released in 1982, and if you think back to some of the movies of 1982, as much as we like to sit there and say, oh no, we were, you know, we we were on top of things, and no 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 no, you, you go back and watch something like Police Academy with today's sensibilities and a lot of those jokes are you're going to sit there and go e yeah no that movie came out today people would be all over it but the thing is you have to take a look at where where the inspiration for this film came from it's you know inspired by and based loosely on loosely being the uh, the, the the quotation fingers there uh, the pirates of penzance that's a gilbert and sullivan play so when you take a look at the you know, the, the, the source material, I mean, it, it was already there to begin with. But the thing is, while the whole, and by, by the way, um, spoilers, but still the film is 41 years old now. So you had your chance, which I'm for the record. Yeah, I know. Right. It's, it's, you take a look at the math and go, oh crap, I'm old. But 
the film itself is set in Mabel, who is played by Christy McNichol, in her dream. So it is literally, the entire movie is a dream. That's it, right? Yes, it's fictional characters. Yes, the dream is set in the 1800s. So you have to take a lot of that into perspective. And to the same token as well, while, yes, you could sit there and argue that, okay, you know, it depicts pirates coming in and trying to plunder and pillage the uh, the women on the island. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a goofy <laughs> comedy. It's hilarious. It's, it's, yeah, but they're all like, oh, no, no, please, no. Yeah. And you're like, yeah. They're like running away as slowly as they can. It's just, it's just goofy and silly. And it's not meant to be be taken seriously. It wasn't meant to be taken seriously 40 years ago. It's certainly not meant to be taken seriously now. But as we know, especially when you look online, no one's got a sense of humor nowadays. You you, you know, let's, let's be honest. But as we know, on Review Yourself, everybody, no politics. So, well, yeah, not that it's political, but yeah, just, just it, it's good to start off with because it's, forget, you know, it's one of those things, if I wasn't doing a podcast about it and I wasn't recording this and I was just chatting with my mate, I wouldn't even mention it. I'd have just cracked on. Not that you're not a friend. I just, <laughs> I just, just cracked on. I wouldn't have put a disclaimer in if I was sat in the pub talking to my mate about it. I'd be like, "Go watch this. It's great." Um. So for anybody who, who doesn't know, because I didn't know, I didn't read anything. So the film starts. It starts with a battle at sea between two, uh, presumably pirate ships, but we're not entirely sure. So and then very quickly we see that it's set in the eighties and it's it's all kind of like this. Uh, I'm trying to think of the right, the right kind of thing. It's just like fake kind of maritime museum type thing, kind of crossed with a party venue. Um, think Pirates of the Caribbean crossed with YMCA's in the Navy. Throw a bit of Baywatch in there, a bit of Grease, a bit of Grease 2. Uh, the non-shark bits of Jaws, I don't know why it reminded me of that. And the dreamlike quality of Scrubs, and you're about halfway there. So just... <laughs> That's, that, that may be the most apt description of this film that I think I've ever heard. Definitely more on the Grease 2 side as opposed to Grease 1. Oh, though. yeah, Grease 2. Yeah, Grease 2. I saw that once. It's the bit where the guy's singing outside the air raid shelter, and I'm like, this th- th- This film is just crackers. But Maxwell Caulfield, who plays the main guy in that kind of the Travolta, the second one, he was in Casualty, which is like a program on British television. He was in that for years, so that's where I knew him from. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, like you were saying, if you can't discern between, or I was saying, we're talking about the 80s, you know, if you can't discern between a goofy film from the 1980s and real life modern, you know, day, I, I can't help you. Like, like you know, you, you, I, you, I can't help daft people. Um, but yeah, it's, it's like a theme park. That's what I saw. It's a theme park. I mean, Mabel, Mabel's absolutely gagging for it. I mean, she, she she's there. She's got the lustful look. Uh, the the guy, what's his name? We don't. Do we actually know his name? In, in like, oh, Frederick. Frederick. Yeah, but do we know his name in the eighties though? I'm not, I don't. Know. I think I think it's still Frederick. No, I, just, I don't think they ever actually got around that. So, I don't know. They never got past introductions in the eighties. Um, and and then also I thought, wow, McDonald's really hasn't changed much because it's just like this nineteen eighties <laughs> McDonald's. I'm like, yeah, that hasn't changed much. Uh, <laughs> it's the beginning bit. I was like, what is this film? Because She's about to get on the boat. She's carrying all the stuff. And then I think her sisters are friends that get on the boat with, with Frederick. And then they're like, and I'm like, they're going to drive off without her. And they like drive off without her. And she, she decides for some reason, yeah, let's, let's get a paddle and let's get an oar and try and row my way after them. She falls off. She almost drowns and she washes up Tom Hanks style on, uh, on a beach, uh, on some kind of Island. And you get the wibbly wobbly effect. And as you were saying, Jason, the dream begins, which is essentially the rest of the film. And what a dream it is. It's the kind of dream that if you walk up from, you'd be like, oh, it's a giant that. I really was. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I just, I mean, oh, I mean, and again, there's jokes such as like, I told you to order Chinese, but this is ridiculous. Like, where do the ninjas come from? I, I just didn't understand that <laughs> at all. These like ninjas turn up. Um, and I, I just, I absolutely loved, loved uh, the main villain, I mean, Ted Hamilton, who plays the pirate captain. Oh, the pirate king. Oh, he is the pirate king. Sorry. Oh, he he is chewing the scenery like he's at a buffet. He it's so much fun. It. Yeah, it's it, it's absolutely fantastic. I mean, you know, a tenor soprano. Oh, even better. I'd, it's the bit where it was the bit where he he uses the knife to slide down the sail. <laughs> 
the the uh and i think he's credited as dwarf pirate so mm-hmm. take whatever description you want and he says it's like because it's australian so blo- he broke our bloody sail that was more english and then they get and then you just see the pirate king just he's just like sew that up love and he just <laughs> no, that, just, that was one of the funniest bits of it for me i just love how like it just doesn't care i just i love it uh he he may be one of the most fun, lovable, bad, you know, quote unquote bad guys in a film that the 80s ever produced. Like he dances on screen. He illuminates literally every scene. Like I, I, I'll be honest, I'm not as familiar with Ted Hamilton's filmography as I probably should be. But the fact that I, I guess to get him on, he actually has an executive producer credit on the film. So, I mean, obviously it was a big enough deal to get him in there, but just the, 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 the suaveness that he gives the pirate King, the, you know, it's, it's almost like a gentleman pirate at this point, but even though he's completely and utterly, um, you know, he's, I mean, he's a pirate. He's going to do pirate things, but it's just so dashing about it that he does. And like every scene that he's in, he makes the scene better. Oh, absolutely. It's it's just outstanding. He's just brilliant. Just every other line's just, I was just laughing. I just thought this is so much fun. There's, there's a lot to be said for a film that just makes you laugh. Mm-hmm. It's stupid. It's re- what uh, we describe as daft. It's really, really daft. But if you're in the mood for it and you just because I don't get me wrong, Jason, in this Defend It Yourself series, which is which has been a, I thought it was a decent idea. I'm not saying it's particularly original, but it's a decent idea. It works well with my review itself. I've just got a beautiful new logo. Thank you, Paul from SB Film Viewers. And you know, it's it's a good idea, but good God, I didn't realize how much crap I was gonna have to watch. Night of the Roxbury, <laughs> you know, reminiscence. Oh, one of the literally the worst film I've ever seen in my life. And I just thought. And I thought, oh, God, what's this going to be like? And when I read what it was kind of about, I thought, oh, this could be bad. This could be bad. But I thought, what a gem. I I, I really enjoyed it. Really, really enjoyed it. I mean, I've always had a bit of a soft spot for musicals. My mum used to have them on Lords as a kid, you know, that kind of Oliver, Annie, that, you know, Sound of Music, which is one of my mum's favourite films. So I've seen that by proxy, not by my own will, far too many times. So it's, it's kind of, you know, and then you get films such as... Uh, which everyone forgets about, like Sweeney Todd, the Demon Barber, Fleet Street, Alan Rickman in a musical set in Victorian England. Yes, please. Uh, oh, have I, I got a musical for you then? Good stuff. Repo the Genetic Opera. Okay, I've, I've not heard of that one. <laughs> we we actually covered that film for our our fiftieth episode because my wife Carrie, who is my my most frequent co host, uh, she and I absolutely love the film. But if I were to tell you you had a rock metal style musical that starred Anthony Stewart Head, uh, Alexa Pena Vega, Paul Sorvino, and somehow Paris Hilton, and it works. Paul Sorvino from Law and Order in a musical. Yep. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. I'm yep. so... and, and Paris Hilton, and she actually works in the role. Well, to be fair, she's in, I don't know if, you know, I, I haven't seen the original, I don't think. She's in House of Wax, 2005. Mm-hmm. I think about that, yeah, because we're yeah. the same time that she was doing the Simple Life TV series. Yeah, that's a good for She's decent in that. If someone yeah. didn't tell you it was Paris Hilton and you just watched it, oh, yeah, okay, fair enough. Look, she's decent in it, so I, I can go with that. Yeah. Absolutely. But I, mean, but I mean, with this one, I mean, if you're just taking a look on uh, at this film on paper, right? For, forget the actual experience of watching the film. You, you take a look at this film on paper. Nine Razzie nominations that year. It won for Worst Song of the Year for Pumpin' and Blowin'. It won for <laughs> Worst Score. It won for Worst Director. It was nominated for Worst Picture. It lost to Inchon. Christopher Atkins was nominated for Worst Actor. He lost to Laurence Olivier for Inchon. Christy McNichol was nominated for Worst Actress. She lost to Pia Zadora in Butterfly. Ted Hamilton, the Pirate King himself, was nominated for Worst Supporting Actor, and he lost to Ed McMahon in Butterfly. But it was actually listed in the official Razzie Movie Guide as one of the 100 most enjoyably bad movies ever. 
Like, and sometimes you just want to watch something that you know right off the yeah. bat is going to be goofy, fun, and yeah. unashamedly about it. No, I can't agree more. And you know what? Again, critics, they're just, I mean, sometimes they can be a little bit kind of, you know, they want something really highfalutin. I, I personally think films are an art. But sometimes, you know, there's an art in doing a film like this well. Oh, so bad it's good if you're going to go that way about it. Like, it's really enjoyable. Like, sometimes these films that become like the critics' darling, I don't see it. Every, I, I don't know what you think. Everything, everywhere, all at once. I didn't see it. Did, I haven't just, seen did, it yet, no. It just honestly, I, I won't spoil anything for you, but I, it was good, enjoyable. Nothing I haven't seen a million times before. The performance was all right. Not worthy of, of any of the Oscars they got. Uh, I didn't think the film was particularly... Uh, the the there's not kind of anything emotional to hang your heart on. I consider, I mean, the whale, which I went to see. I love Brendan Fraser, but I went to see that, explaining that to be not as good as it was. Thought I bet Fraser's great, but it's not that great. That's unbelievable. The best film I saw last year was All Quiet on the Western Front, the German adaptation. Absolutely unbelievable. The idea that Felix Camera, the guy who plays the German soldier in that, did not get nominated and di didn't win an Oscar, and then. It, it just I watched it and I just I just didn't get it. I was like I don't see what everybody else is like loves about this. So sometimes I'm very skeptical when critics are like, oh my god, this is amazing. Like like everything everywhere all at once is the more is the most successful, the most awarded film of all time. And you're like, you I watched it and I was like, right, okay, even if I've missed the point and it's great, good action, I'll give it that, and it's original. But I think it's come along at a time when there's so much samey, samey stuff out there that it stood out a bit more than it usually would have done. And it's not, it doesn't deserve to be up there with, you know, like the untouchables or, 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 or films like, of that ilk. And I just, yeah, anyway. Yeah, it's it's more a case, I think, of the, uh, you know, the, the, the nicest smelling turd in the pile kind of thing where I'll admit I haven't seen the film, <laughs> but it's one of those things okay. where... You've you know, got it... description. We're one all on the description battle here. <laughs> That is fantastic. <laughs> I love that one. But the the thing is, though, like a lot of critics, I think I feel like they go into the movies and they try to out snob each other. Like they come armed with a thesaurus and a bad attitude, and they're ready to pick apart anything that they think is remotely, you know, it's it, it's almost like and I can't remember. I think it was Martin Scorsese or Martin Scorsese who was going on and on about uh, superhero films and how they're, you know, basically. Uh, diluting the yeah. market, you know, and it's like who well, he, cares? He called them, he called them uh, theme park rides, and he's right. That's what they are. Yeah, good. But, but the thing is, right. some sometimes you just want to go in and have fun. Like I, I feel like Homer Simpson, right? Well, this film has you know, uh, you know depth and and character, but ball in the groin has a ball in the groin, and sometimes you want to watch ball in the groin type films. Of course, you do. You absolutely, you know, those films that you watch and you're just like, this is just stupid. But God, I love it. Like, you know, right. you know you, there's, I mean, that kind of slapstick has always appealed to me. I, I, Lauren and Hardy's, you know, Way Out West, one of the funniest films ever made, if not the funniest. Uh, and it shocks me how many people have never seen it. But it's just, you just wonder, like, what people are looking for. And you're right, critics sometimes go to like, impress me, darling. No, no. Yeah. Like, you're not, what do you, what do you expect? But then to the same token, if if you're looking for a movie that is knowingly clever and, you know, basically poking fun at its own self, I mean, you, you've got Christopher Atkins, who prior to this film was in the Blue Lagoon. And the, the bathing suit that he wears when they go to dig up the, the, the treasure chest out of the bottom of the, the ocean, it's basically the same swimsuit. And you don't think that they did that, you know, without a, a bit of a a wink and a nod. There's this scene where at the beginning of Mabel's dream sequence where she's watching um, her sisters do the sister's song and then she looks at the camera and says, can you believe this song? The reason why is because she, prior to this film, was in a movie called uh, Little Darlings with Tatum O'Neill. And in that movie, her character watched a high school play of the Pirates of Penzance, specifically watching that song. So it's very self, self-aware, right? It's almost yeah. as if Deadpool did a musical. And this is kind of what it was because of course, Mabel does break the fourth wall. She continuously looks at the camera with very much a wink and a nod. 
allowing you to be able to sit there and say, okay, they know exactly what yeah. they're doing and they're, yeah. they're having fun doing it. Exactly. I mean, I was, I was meaning to come out of this about like, what do you think about the film references? You know, the star Wars is Indiana Jones. It's very eighties. You know, there's, there's uh kind of inspector Clouseau. There's, there's all kinds of, there's probably more if you, I mean, I wasn't born in the eighties. I was a nineties kid. So <laughs> it's a bit more of a struggle for me, but I think to, to, do you think it hurts the film at any point to have that many references in there? I think by the time you get to that point in the film, if, if you're not already on the ship and, and sailing with them, then you shouldn't even still be in the theater. Because at, at this point, it's gone, you know, you have your, you know, Keystone Cops-esque kind of, you know, uh, constabulary who are singing along a march along you have your very inspector clouseau like inspector uh you have the star wars reference where the the, the sword becomes a lightsaber yeah. like at this point it's just full-on goofball and that is the charm of it if you watched free guy and you lost your ish when like all of a sudden the, the the Captain America shield comes out and then you got the Hulk hand and all the video game references. It's kind of like that um, at that point where it's just, let's throw in everything that's fun at this point. And anyone who sits there, and I, I took a look at some of the, the critic comments here. Again, just to put it, this movie into perspective, the Irish Times called it a travesty of the original. In Leonard Maltin's movie guy, they said the movie should have been called the ripoff movie. Uh, in the Son of Golden Turkey Awards book, uh, they said the first love is on the list of worst rock and roll lyrics in a movie. And uh, critic Michael Adams put it on his list of worst ever Australian films. And I'm just wondering, what are they looking for? Like, I, I get that they say they are, you know, loosely based or inspired by the Pirates of Pendants. And if you're looking for a movie that's going to recreate that, you're not going to get it. The funny thing is, this movie was um, rushed out so they could they they could be because there was a there was a a version of the Pirates of Penzance movie coming out around that time. So they literally put the rush on this one to to beat to beat the punch, right? And maybe from a, a production perspective, that may have suffered a little bit. But I mean, this was never meant to be a true adaptation of the actual move or of the actual play it was meant to be fun that's why they wrote different songs for it it's not just songs from the gilbert and sullivan play although those moments are in there and they're really really fun um although i have to say and i'm, I'm going to ask you on this one here is it me or did the songs that they wrote specifically for this film thirsty as hell because you take a look at the lyrics are like pumping and blowing it's like uh, what it's like still Panther level lyrics. Well, what about what about the, uh, the 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 ending was give us a happy ending every time. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I know what kind of happy ending you're talking about, and it's yeah, absolutely, it's it's just dripping with that kind of nineteen eighties, just lustfulness every which way. Um, that's not no pun intended, but it's literally just just everywhere, and these really like there's just like I just love the way that it, the innuendos. I, I look like I grew up uh, um, on kind of bottom. If you've ever seen the TV series Bottom with Rick Mail and Ed Edmondson, no, I haven't yet. No, w worth catching that. So in the, uh, in the 1990s, it's just slapstick and innuendo. It's it's fantastic, and it's that kind of you know. And the whole the, the whole bit. See, I've used like the, like the whole um, where he's like, you'll get a hundred lashes, and he's like, promises, promises. Um, you know, you get the I am the very model of a modern major general, which I, I didn't realize was from the Pirates of Penzance. It was one of the only songs that I was like, oh, okay, I know that one. Um, just the lines, just like, it's the bit where like, uh, Mabel has fought off the Pirate King, basically on her own. And then <laughs> Frederick just appears and he's like, yeah, you did well for a woman, but now there's a work, there's men, there's ma there's a man's work to be done. <laughs> <laughs> and the bit where it's like I, I'm shy and a feminist, and the Pirate King's like I love a woman who knows her place. I just thought I thought I love I love this. It's hilarious. Like you've oh, there's got to be something to be said for a film that's just it knows what it is. And I just thought I just I just really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, I mean, 
and then it's but it's making points about if we if women had bigger positions things would be better kind of like you know where where she says to her dad like uh, and she's more uh, the major general and she's kind of mourning and he's like with women leading armies uh, we'll never have another decent war again and she like pops back through the door and she's like yes yes um um kind of thing and I thought well, that that's you know it's 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 funny stuff but yeah I mean and the sword fighting is decent I was quite impressed with that. I enjoyed this more than the Three Musketeers, nineteen ninety three. I'll get, I'll, I'll say that. Well, I think the thing too with you know some of the, for lack of a better term, misogyny in this film is that consider who is actually saying these things. You know, you have the pirate king saying these things. You have the pirates themselves saying these things. These are the people who, in the grand scheme of the story, are in the wrong. So when you have the the, the baddies saying the dumb things it puts into context what it is they're actually trying to say. Mabel is the hero of this whole dream sequence, right? So the fact that everyone that Mabel is going up against is saying the dumb things tells you that exactly what the, 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 the thought process behind, you know, it, it's like, it's like if you have an idiot, you know, and I, I, I constantly flash back to this uh, Kevin Smith Q and a, and someone challenged him on the movie chasing Amy. Kevin Smith has, has gone on and said like he, he's a, an ally to LGBTQ and someone challenged him about chasing Amy and how Jason Lee's character was like, well, all she needs is a good dick, right? His response is, yeah, but it's the idiot saying it. You know, it's not the people you're rooting for. It's the idiot who's saying these kind yeah. of things, therefore puts it into context. Yeah. Here, the baddies are the ones that are are downplaying uh the women's contributions therefore they're saying that the women's contributions are are good because yeah. you have the idiot saying it well yeah i mean i mean i've not seen that film but and i don't know much about kevin smith he's uh but i think apart from he's in die hard 4.0 or live for a die hard if you're america over there <laughs> i think um the whole thing with that is he's right in essence of yes idiots will have that view if you decide to scrap that and be like, we're never having an offensive opinion on television or film again, do you think that's going to fix things? Do you think brushing everything underground is going to, is going to magically make things better? Because as we've seen in recent years, it makes it worse. So this idea that if you push forward, and I, I did a master's in history, and I, I've looked back at, you know, we, we made the same mistakes over and over again, humans. And if you push it, brush everything under the carpet, we we never want an offensive thing on television again. There's a history program on, uh, 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 that's set in an awful time, an awful time, and there would have been slurs used and whipping. No, no, we're going we're going to censor that down, and we can't use that word because it's 2023. No, use the word because it's in its historical context, because it's remembering like look, like look how bad, like look at what happened before, and thank like, Christ we've learned from it. But if you brush that under the carpet and just pretend it never happened, well, not pretend it never happened, but you think, oh my God, well we can't because it might upset some people. No, no, I'm sorry, you can't care, you can't pander or cater to the the one percent who are going to get upset about everything, because the other ninety nine percent, you know, you've you can't help idiots. Do you do you think if you if you take every kind of this is why I don't do politics, but if you think if you took every offensive, you know, film that's ever been made, so right, let's let's cut out the um, summer loving song out of Greece because that you know the the overtures that are a bit rough nowadays. Oh, you yeah. know, let, let's cut that down and no, let's let's get rid. Well, no, 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 keep it in there because it's if that was made later. It what that again was a pastiche of what the sixties was like. So they no doubt at the time knew the the word is kind of sensitive about as we are now, or, or not not sensitive, but as aware as we are. But at the time, it was a pastiche of the sixties. It wasn't made in the sixties for the sixties. It was made in the eighties for the sixties. I'm not right. It's no late seventies, eighties, Greece, nineteen seventy. Uh, yeah, it was, it was in the 70s, I think it was. 78, yeah. 78, I think. So like that. I, anyway. I, I, yeah, either 77 or 78, but yeah, set in the 50s. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, 50s. So yeah, yeah. Oh, it was out there, damn it. Usually good my dates. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, you can't care like that. And, and you just, you can't, it, do, it does nobody any good. It doesn't do anybody any good to pretend things didn't happen or, or to kind of like just, oh no, well, we can't have that because it might upset. Well, so what? It's yeah. it, that you're meant to get an emotional reaction from it. Like, Crack on with it. But anyway, that's getting far too serious for a film like this. But yeah, I mean, 
why do you think sorry did you ask about sex well i was i was about to say that it, it's one of those things where in the attempt to not offend people you're going to eventually offend someone the the simple fact of the matter is you can like a a, a work of art you can like something done by someone completely horrible i mean we we say this on the on the podcast a number of times too where when we're reviewing a movie sometimes a movie comes up and it's got someone in it that has you know fallen out of favor we we talked we talked about the movie fanboys which i love that film but executive producer kevin spacey you know so you have to sit there and say okay we can talk about the film and we can still sit there and say anything that Kevin Spacey was accused of is completely wrong. You know, it's, it's like musicians, right? You can sit there and say, I don't agree with things that Ted Nugent says, but I still think cat scratch fever is a decent song, right? You can, you can have both opinions. It doesn't have to be so didactic. Like, okay, so this person said this, I'm now going to burn all of my CDs and, and melt all my VHS tapes. You don't have to. These are fictional characters. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I can't agree more. I don't know who half the people you're talking about are, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> the all over the pond uh, problems. But no, I, I, I agree completely. And I think, you know, it, it's, uh, I had a good example and it's gone straight. Oh, yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, uh, Capricorn One. Great film. Mm -hmm. Really underrated gem. But one of the people in that, oh, no, he fell out of favor. So, you, you know, it's, it's just, yeah, but you could still watch it and enjoy it for what it is because it's not real life. Um, and I, I've, you know, and when you start talking about getting rid of things and canceling things and destroying copies of things and taking them down off platforms and well, hang on a minute, that, 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 that's a, a very worrying thing that tends to only happen in dictatorships. Oh God, I'm getting political. Ah, whatever. I'll just put it down. <laughs> um, uh, but, yeah, but it, it, it's, it's like, really the, good. it's like with the Dixie chicks, right? Uh, during the Iraq war, uh, they came out and they, they said that they were ashamed that George Bush was from their home state of Texas and people lost their ish. There were CD burning parties, radio stations were no longer playing their songs. And now they've come back and they're having a, a, a career resurgence kind of thing. And the problem is if you were a fan beforehand, you were a fan because their music spoke to you, not because you were a fan of the people themselves, but it's because of the songs yeah. they wrote. And then by falling into that, that whole mob mentality of like, oh, they said something bad, I'm gonna join everyone in it. No, the songs themselves aren't the things that are offensive, right? So you can still like the music and disagree with someone. Now, that's the thing too. It's no longer just disagreeing with someone or something. It's yeah. like all of a sudden you have to have this massive movement behind things. You can disagree and, or at least agree to disagree and then move on from there. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Did you I'm saying, how, how did we get there from a movie with a song called pumping and blowing it? I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> and I don't know how much of that'll stay in the edit. Cause I'll be listening to it going, where, the, where, the, where have we gone here? Yeah, the the song with the coppers. The what is it? Truck to rum to rum to to rum to ra. It's the bit like I, I, there's something I really enjoy. Uh, I don't know why, but like seeing choreographed, a lot of people wearing the same stuff, doing like a choreographed dance. I just I really enjoy, and it's just silly. And yeah, I enjoyed it. I don't know how many more times I can say that phrase, but um, did you think? What did you think of the musical numbers? Okay, so. <laughs> I actually wrote down some of the lyrics here for what for one of the songs, Pumping and Blowing, just because th this song stands out as so wrong in so many levels, but I, you still have to sit there and appreciate just the happiness. Of it. Like, again, let me read the lyric here. If he's treading water and romance is on the slide, don't you know you have to swallow something more than water? It's your pride. Like, in this movie... This movie is so freaking thirsty. Um, like to the point of like a band like Steel Panther would applaud lyrics like that. And this is a band that wrote a song called Gang Bang at the Old Folks Home. Like it's <laughs> it's it's so wrong in so many ways. And I and I, I so I get why you know that song won the Razzie for worst song of the year, but to the same token as well, you know, it's the 80s. You're going to have those. Uh, Olivia Newton, John, John Travolta esque kind of duets, you know, with the half dissolves, where they're oh, singing "My First Love." It's so classic. Yeah, I mean, like it's you know, 
you can see where the Grease comparables would be coming from, you know, and the songs that they pulled from the Gilbert and Sullivan play, like the, I, I am the very model of a modern major general, you know, um, or, or the sister song where they're um, dancing on the beach and doing the, the umbrella dance there when Frederick sees them while he's on the boat. Like this is the stuff that <laughs> if you like the original musical, you're going to be like, okay, I'm right on board with this. And then it goes, and that's the thing. It's a dream sequence. You know, we're not always going to dream exactly what we see on stage. But to the same token as well, and and this reminds me of a. I'm going to make a, the most Canadian reference I could possibly make here. Oh, is it, if it's Ryan Reynolds, can you think of something else? Oh no no no! It is not Ryan Reynolds. It is in fact Bob and Doug McKenzie, uh, two characters that were created for the SCTV sketch comedy show, uh, acted by Dave Thomas and Rick Moranis. Uh, they are two very very Canadian cable TV hosts. They would you know basically. Uh, host this show on there on the uh, called uh, the Great White North, and literally they would talk about frying up back bacon and drinking beer while wearing toques. And you know, it, it's it's the most Canadian, but still knowingly, you know, making fun of the Canadian aspect. I think they did a movie in 1983 called Strange Brew, <laughs> and if you watch it, it's it's you know, it's exactly what you expect a Bob and Doug McKenzie movie to be like. But then when you watch it again with a, with a critical analysis, you realize that, okay, so they just basically took Hamlet, filled it with a bunch of beer and, and went with it. It's funny as hell. If you, especially if you're a Canadian and you laugh even harder at it. Um, you know, so you, you would watch it and maybe not necessarily get all of the jokes that are in it, but it plays on the beer, the hockey, uh, the dog that basically crashes Oktoberfest. But the entire thing is basically Hamlet. And that's kind of the thing with this film. It takes its inspiration and its cues from the Pirates of Penzance and then just turns it on its head and has fun with it. It's nothing has to be, or not everything has to be, a direct adaptation of the source material, you can, you know, tip your hat to the source and then have fun with it on the side. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, if every, if everything ever made was a direct adaptation, I mean, that wouldn't, I mean, it wouldn't, it's difficult to do if it's a book for a start, mm -hmm. then if it's a musical, well, you got to stage it differently and set it differently. It, it's not possible to do it exactly the same way because they're made for a theatre. So it's it's a very difficult thing to try and to try and pull off. And like I've never seen the original musical, but this made me want to go see it. So it's a, it's and, a and that's the funny thing too. Sometimes not being so faithful to the original, but at least knowing where the source material comes from makes you more inclined to go actually watch it. Like I'll I'll admit this movie came out when you know I was you know young and you know just getting into you know like watching full-length movies and and having them mean something like around this time you know again strange brew came out in 1983 i think crawl came out i think in this year as well too and crawl was such a fun film that it, i still remember that film today even though it may not necessarily hold up but i we again we covered it for the show and i'm like no okay i, I understand why i liked this film and that's the other thing too Sometimes we watch something when we're kids and you, at the, at the time it's the coolest thing ever. And then you watch it when you're an adult and you're like, man, I was a dumb, dumb kid. What was the hell was I thinking? Why did I think this was cool? Um, this film watching it. And again, I'm going to say it 41 years later when, you know, after it comes out, it's, it still holds the fun to it. Like, Forget sensibilities, forget the mindset of the 2023 uh, moviegoer. It's a fun film. Like, just go in and, and forget the fact that it's a 1982 film. Just, just enjoy it. Yeah, absolutely spot on. Why do you think it gets so much stick? Uh, stick. Uh, uh, why do you think it gets so much, not hatred, like rotten tomatoes thrown at it? Why do you think it gets so much... Why, why is it such derision, to put it partially? The way I look at it is this. There are certain films out there that are based on books or stage plays or whatever the case may be, and they divert from the source material. 
Um, we covered uh, a movie on here called The Circle. It stars Emma Watson, Tom Hanks, uh, based on the book by Dave Eggers. And it's also got Karen Gillan in it, John Boyega. Like, it's got a phenomenal cast. And for the first half of the film, or first three quarters of the film, it's very faithful to the actual book. Mm -hmm. And then it just turns left where it should have turned right. And the, the, the end of the book is tonally and completely different from what ended up on the film. And I get why they did it because the end of the book, it, it's kind of like World War Z. The end of the book yeah, of World yeah, War Z yeah. is a complete and utter downer. And then you, you, you watch the movie. It's like, I, I don't remember this part of the book. It didn't happen. Same thing with the circle. Yeah. So people looking at the pirate movie and in the credits says, you know, uh, inspired by uh, the pirates of Penzance, you go in expecting certain things, well, at least critics would. And when it doesn't meet up to that, you sit there and go, ah, no, right? The this, this yeah. snobbery comes yeah. out. Out comes the thesaurus and they try to find clever ways of dissing the film. When you're not going in just without any preconceived notion whatsoever. Remember that this movie is going to aim itself at people who aren't necessarily familiar with the source material itself. Like when I first watched this film, I had no clue what the pirates of Penzance was no, none whatsoever. Right. So I get to go in not having a preconceived notion. It's like watching a, a superhero, like going into to watch Moon Knight. You know, that, that series when it came out on Disney Plus. My knowledge of New Moon Knight came strictly from playing the character in a video game, and that's about it. I had no idea about the backstory. I had no idea of what the character should be. So you get to enjoy the movie for the, or at least in this case, the TV series, for the TV series sake and without a preconceived notion of who should be playing it, how they should be played, or whatever. I get that people are going to be guarded when it comes to things that they are familiar with and comfortable with and all of that so anyone going in expecting the pirates of penzance don't people going in expecting a fun time with the occasional song that they might actually remember oh hey you know what then, then it is a good time yeah can't say it by myself i i Really enjoyed it. I will say this though, World War uh oh, you guys say Z, Z, World War Z. Um it I love the differences between this side of the Atlantic and the other. I like it's great. Not all of them, but <laughs> if I get serious. No, I am um, I, I do I do uh World War Z, I read the book, and the book is so different to the like the film, you just gotta you just gotta forget like, go watch the film as if it's just a zombie film, like forget the title. Because if you go to watch it, if anybody went to watch that after reading the book and thought it was going to be like, the book for anyone who doesn't know is almost like if you've ever read any of the Forgotten Voices or one of those war books or a kind of, uh, even I tell you a good example is probably Dracula, the, the book of Dracula, if anyone's ever read that school or college or uni or whatever, that when you read that, it's all diary uh Excerpts of diaries from Jonathan and, and, and uh, Renfield, sorry, and you know Jonathan and and, and all the others. It, it it doesn't tell kind of a coherent story. You've got to work out what's going on. Like it's a mystery in that that way. World War Z similar in that it's all these little bits from all over the world. And to be fair, I think they made a mistake. The film I love World War Z. The film I think is great for uh, for what it is. It's got some cracking bits in it, but. I think the book, it should have been a TV series, a limited run, eight episodes, you know, ha have it be globe trotting. It did a decent amount of money, have it be globe trotting and have it kind of have all, you know, ha shows a different part of the world every, you know, every every week and then, you know, bring it together. I, I get why the film was like, well, we can't do that because it's all disconnected because it's a film. So you need to follow someone. So I'll we'll follow Brad Pitt. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Um, but yeah, I'd, anyway, tangent. Um, I, I think that's why people are leaning more towards series than they are towards movies these days is that you have the space to expand and, you know, have a much larger palette to paint with, you know, with a movie and you, you could argue with this one as well. It's about an hour and a half. You know, most movies are in that 90 minutes to two hour range, obviously, because you don't want to have them sitting on their butt in the theater too long. 
I still have horror flashbacks of the Batman because that movie just lasted forever. It could have oh, ended about 20 minutes. God. <laughs> oh, there's somebody else. Oh, I'm so happy. I'm so I mean, happy. It was, it was a good film, but I mean, just way too long. Take an hour off it, for Christ's sake. Take you could, an hour, very take an hour easily. off it, easily. And just streamline the bloody thing. And yeah. for a film that's so bloody long, there's no character development in it. It's it's just, it, it, there's, I just didn't get it. Too many people in it. I thought Catwoman, I thought she was completely wasted. Couldn't, I mean, I, I wouldn't say Zoe Kravitz was bad. She just had nothing to work with. Uh, you know, I, I didn't like the fact that, because I, I, what they did with Pattinson, because Robert Pattinson is a, a charming guy, a very suave guy, you know, very charming. He, when I watched, uh, what was it called? The, the latest Nolan that I, I wasn't the massive fan of, uh, Tenet, when I watched that, that felt like Pattinson doing his kind of audition for James Bond. And he's mm-hmm. very, very, he's like about the only character in it that saves it, really. Although John David Washington was decent. Was it, well, either way. Um, it was just... I thought I was looking forward to seeing him do Bruce Wayne. I thought his Bruce Wayne would be brilliant because kind of, you know, Christian Bale's Batman was, uh, Bruce Wayne was a little bit kind of here and there. He'd pop up and buy a restaurant and then he'd, you'd never see him for another hour type thing. Um, but, you know, I went with that and I was looking forward to that and we never got it. We just got this mopey, kind of like depressed kind of a person who wasn't, didn't have a life. He was just waiting for kind of the Batman and it was like, right, okay, well, I'm not really with this. And then it was three hours long. I went to see it twice. I got dragged by two different friends and thought the, se- and thought the second time, like, oh, come on, like maybe, maybe this time you'll see what you missed. And it was just another three hours of my life wasted. And because I knew everything that was going to happen, there was no surprises. And then how bad it was. Well, how, how poor it was, you know, compared to the first time I watched it really kind of read its head. I was so disappointed in that. If you compress and take out some of the scenes, then it's actually a really decent Batman film. The, the problem yeah. with Robert Pattinson is that he falls into the same trap as every Batman ever does is that you can either be a really good Batman or you can be a really br- good Bruce Wayne, but it's hard to be both. I think you know, it could be both. It could yeah. be both, but they didn't give him the opportunity to even, to even try be Bruce Wayne. It was like, no, no, Bruce, you're going to be more pee and you're going to keep your eyeliner on, and that's about it. Like, that, yeah. That's all they were going for. They just, and then I thought, why don't you put... I mean, the pe- Colin Farrell as a penguin was the best bit in it, by an absolute mile. The villains have got... There's some genuinely, and I, I mean this sincerely, because a Canadian uh, compatriot of yours, Dan Mackles, loves the film, and we've 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 had a few discussions on, on it. I'll agree, there's some absolutely genius moments in it. Batman being the shadows... I loved Gotham, probably the, one of the best Gotham's we've ever seen. Grungy, drug-ridden, crime-ridden, proper inner city, just a mess, just an urban, exactly what it should be. Whereas, you know, we'll, we'll talk about Joe Schumacher. We've seen what it was like in that, it was just neon. Tim Burton, it was a bit gothic because you know, it's Tim Burton's thing. You know, Christopher Nolan's, it was just New York, which well, I wasn't a big, wasn't a big issue, but it was just New York uh, pretty much. And I thought, you know, oh, well, the first one was a bit different with the with that. The, was it the Shallows? Or the, the, the League of Shadows, yeah. No, no, sorry. The, I mean, in Gotham, they had that area, didn't they? What was it called? Where they set off all the gas, the Shallows or the... Yeah, so so there, there was almost like the uh, like the slums of Gotham as yeah, opposed yeah. to like the downtown, yeah. yeah. You know, so I like that. And there's some genuinely genius bits of it. And if the Batman film would have ended where he's walking with the flare, He's become something more. He's become a symbol, you know. Yes, brilliant. But it drags itself on for the 20 odd minutes and, and ends on this awful, like the driving off in separate ways, you know. Oh, and they're looking in the rearview mirror with like, you know, love in their eyes. It's like, really? Like, the I've never seen the Fast and Furious films, but they did that with Paul Walker and everyone loved it. Like, th- that's been done. I know it was yeah. enough. I know because of the situation it was, but I just mean they did it and they did it well, you know. What what you what are you trying to do? It wasn't a love story, so tr- stop trying to make it one. Yeah, um, L- long doesn't equal good, no, right? I, I, no. There are certain movies that did pull off long and it worked well. Like I think Infinity War and Endgame, they oh, needed yeah. to be as yeah. long as they were because th- they were setting up this massive story. Especially when you realize that that's two films basically, you know, back to back. Once upon a time in Hollywood, the Quentin Tarantino film. Still haven't seen yeah. that yet. I'm I'm watching that film and I like Tarantino films. Don't get me wrong, but I could take about a half an hour out of that easily. Yeah, without even thinking about it. 
Well, that's another thing about, I mean, I, I don't have, you know, because it's on my logo and it's, it's above my head. Uh, it's one of my favourite films of all time, Titanic. That's a long film. Mm-hmm. Shawshank Redemption is a long film. Green Mile is a long film. Uh, the Untouchables is quite a long film. Some of the, uh, One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest, quite a long film. You know, I th- but I think we've got to this point where, you know, directors are like, oh, well, this film's going to be three hours. Why? Does it need, I mean... You know, Christopher Nolan after Tenet has got a lot of making up to do with me as much as I, I enjoy. But the, I mean, this Oppenheim is going to be close to three hours. It's like, what do you like? It's, it's a long, it's genuinely a long time to sit there. Like the Batman, you know, you need to go to the toilet. Yeah. You know, you, you, you think, do I dare buy a drink? Because if I need a wee halfway through and, you know, stuff like that, you know, it's just like, you shouldn't have to think about like is my you know is my backside going to be numb by the time I leave? Uh, will I be leaving before midnight? You know, it, it's that kind of thing of it. It, it just seems unnecessary. I have nothing wrong. I could be you know Oppenheimer could come out and it could it could need every one of those th- three hours or just under three hours. Fine. Inception, love that. That's not a short film. You, yeah. you know, so there's plenty of examples that I've got. So I'm not against long films per se. I mean, well, if it's for, as a rule of thumb, as a rule of thumb, movies shouldn't necessarily, you know, be so long that if you go in as a date, you come out as common law, like that. It shouldn't be that I mean. way. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, are you going on what? You going late one day and come out early the next? You know, it's just there's no, there's no, re- there's no reason for that. Are you indulging yourself? It's almost like, and I love books. It's almost like when you read a good book. But you feel like that needed. You like the book, and you say yeah, it was all right. I enjoyed it. I wouldn't read it again because it needed a bloody good editor. There's something to be said for someone who can say, actually, no. Do we really need this? Or have we said it in a look? Or can we say it shorter? Or can we, you know, have a bit of a montage? Because I know montages have a bit of a you know, bad reputation, but they work. They, they can work. There's nothing wrong with them, you know. And if films worked for all those years at being about ninety minutes, why all of a sudden are we like, oh, it must be three hours? No. No, no, it shouldn't. Like, like you, you. I remember watching the Batman thinking an hour and a half in, we're halfway through. Like, that's not that. You know, if you need two films to tell your story, yeah. Like June, which I still haven't seen that, but I've heard really good things. Split it in half. Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part One and Two. If you need to do it faithfully and it takes that long to do because you need to tell the story, put it in a two. It's not a big issue. That's how you have to do it. But to, but to cram it all into one. That's another thing about the, the Batman. It felt like about two or three films, ideas crammed in. We need Catwoman, we need Penguin, we need Maroney, we need B- Bruce Wayne and what's his, uh, and Alfred wasted Andy Serkis, just like Jeremy Irons was wasted in, you know, that that realm. It's like, oh God, like if it, my biggest frustration with films comes when it's like you had all the ingredients for like a brilliant dish there, but you used too much of this, too little of that. You made a right, you know, right mess of it. You just needed to like kind of kind of just have somebody just have somebody brutal to be like, look, do we need that? Do we need this? And you wonder if if the film industry is full of people like that. And I, and I don't think it is. I don't know what it's like, but I think maybe there's a lot of yes people. You know, is it? Oh yes, yes, yes. Well, I'm gonna you know because. I don't know. Anyway, I, I'm not commenting on people. I'm well, sure you, they all try and do a good job, and I'm sure they all work hard. But it's just you there, just wonder sometimes. There was a fascinating documentary on YouTube uh, called The Cutting Edge, and it's about film editing. Um, and you, you see these directors talking about the relationships that they have with their, with their editors and how it has to be this this back and forth. This It has to be this. Um, I remember Spielberg in that documentary was talking about how the editor on Jaws uh, would sit there and always try to shorten the scenes with the shark. We know that the shark, when they were filming that movie, didn't work as much as they you know, had wanted it to. So the editor was constantly shaving frames here and there from the scene. And Spielberg was doing his best to try and get more in there. He's trying to put it in there because he spent so much time and money in filming the shark. And she's trimming it back because, you know, the difference between a couple of frames here and a couple of frames there, quote unquote, from Spielberg, is you get this terrifying shark as opposed to a great white floating turd. That's the exact quote that he he used in that documentary. I am personally, I'm a video editor, so I, I actually understand you know, the need to be able to trim things down. And yes, sometimes you want to put more in. You spent so much time, but sometimes 
it 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 it's didactic in the script it yeah. doubles down where it doesn't need to double down yeah. it's just unnecessary yeah. you have to sit there and say the cutting room floor exists for a reason yeah. and scenes that end up there actually make the film better yeah well it's like it's like and i know it's really odd but it's like editing editing a podcast i love a good tangent and there was a time re- years back or years up where i would take out the tangents and i'd make them in an episode but it got to a point where I was like, and I leave the majority of stuff in. I know for a fact when I come to edit this episode, there will be things that come out of it because you go so far off the reservation that you think, hang on a minute, uh, if I'm listening to this and I'm editing it and I'm editing it and I, I've had the conversation, I'm going, hang on, where, where are we? Then how's an audience? <laughs> you know, I've no doubt that that's part of the charm. Like if you want a straightforward movie podcast, you're not probably not going to get it here. But I think there's good points made. But there are sometimes you get like you get moments where you know in in a conversation where it's hilarious, but you think that's not going to work because earlier on I cut out a reference to that and that this joke doesn't work anymore, so that's going to have to come out. You know, mm-hmm. I don't I don't massively edit, I don't I really don't. I'm talking a couple of a couple of minutes if that you know trimming things down, trim off the end, and make it sound a little bit you know all right. So I don't do loads, but I think there is a point to be made for. Does this need to stay in or? Well, if you took that bit out of this bit now, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, but it's a great laugh. Or oh, it's a really nice bit. Of yeah, but it doesn't make sense. It's just going to have to go. So, yeah. you know, and don't get me wrong. Every now and again, I use parts of those <laughs> and put, the, put them for the patrons. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, give them a tangents part. But I, I like that part of it. Like the majority of our chats about editing, that'll stay because it's a conversation. Like for people, I, I listen to my podcast because I want to. I like the people that I listen to. I like the way they talk. And I think, well... I want to hear a conversation. I know people who don't edit theirs at all. And I think fair play. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah. Oh, I, I mean, there's something to be said about editing, but there's also that, you know, that old music adage, right? Sometimes it's not the notes you play, but it's the notes you don't play. Uh, same thing with, with film editing, right? Sometimes it's the scene you pull out that makes the scene better as a whole. Um I, but I think this is, you know, getting back to the pirate movie here, that's where this film kind of, you know, fits in that pocket nicely. It's about 90 minutes, so it's it's a comfortable sit and watch. It's a comfortable, like, you go in, you have a good time, you come out, you have dinner, you're able to sit there and laugh about some of the things that happened in the film. And there's a lot of sit to, to laugh and enjoy about it. But, and, and I'm, I'm going to put this out there, right? All these films that come out that are super long, you can only play them so many times during the day, right? So you can only have so many yeah. screenings. So a shorter film means an extra, at least one play in the theater at the time. You're actually making more money off a shorter film. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's, which is why the box office hall of Titanic is even more impressive, but no, I'm joking, but no, <laughs> it, 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 it does make you wonder like why, why they do it. it I mean, it, it, because when they're so long that it's like, Oh my God, you, even when it's good, you're like, Oh, this is too long. It's hard to sustain somebody's interest for that long. It's difficult to do it. And it's impressive when a film does it, but there's, t- there's too many now that are just pushing it to a long length. Mm-hmm. And because, but kind of because they can, it's like, well, should you really? Would you like to split it in half or it, trim it down a bit, make, make it more of a, you know, just, but but who knows? Who knows? A, a long film doesn't make you, you know, uh, a, 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 a cinema genius. It just makes yeah. you, doesn't make you yeah, doesn't make you Scorsese. All right, don't, yeah, don't. no. So, but, but I mean, you, you take a look at, you know, we we joked earlier about the 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 Rotten Tomato score and the critics and whatnot and how you know they just don't get it. Look at the audience score: seventy six percent for a nineteen eighty two musical that is as goofy as it is fun. That tells you exactly where this film. Like this is one of the bigger swings I've seen on a film in the history of doing it's not that bad. Like you're talking literally a 67% swing from critic to audience. That just tells you that, you know, people aren't going to watch this film because they want some, you know, cinematic retelling of a Gilbert and Sullivan stage play. No, 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 no. They want Christy McNichol on the beach 
looking at the camera, making jokes. They want Ted Hamilton being the this dashing debonair pirate king that you sit there and go, I like him even though he's the baddie, right? Christopher Atkins, meh, okay. Bill Kerr as as the 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 major general, the you know uh, Mabel's father. He is so much fun doing the 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 modern major general song. Oh, like, it's, it's a bit just... where he runs in and she's like, "Father," and he's like, "No, no, darling, I'm on." She's like, no, <laughs> she's like, just like brushes her aside. Oh, I love that bit. But it it has those those hints of Monty Python. It has those yeah. hints of um. Oh God, I can't even remember the the comedian's name. British comedian Benny Hill. It has yeah. a little bit of that do, Benny do you know Hill what? type feel. I was going to say, it, and Benny Hill's in this musical. It has kind of hints of those kind of chitty chitty bang bang. Those kind of kind of films where they were just enjoyable. You went to the cinema or the theater as you see over there. You go and you enjoy it. You you just you, you come out of it and go. You know, what? I really enjoyed that. The the film. It's been quite a few years. Like it's been a lot, quite a few years since I, I. Very rarely do I see films and I come up with the same kind of feeling, but it is a bit different. So, so bear with me on this, people. And Jason, <laughs> I went to see the Pope's Exorcist recently, and I absolutely loved it. Like because it was just it was like goofy, and silly, but it knew exactly what it was, and it just felt like such a glorious throwback to, to a time when films were made. And they were just fun. And there, there was just such fun in making them. Like, And I don't disagree that, because people know my thoughts on superhero films, I think superhero films have got that big now that it's almost like, well, we need to make a lot of money with this. And it's like they've lost, and we'll get into it, because I've, I've people will be fed up with me banging on about it. But I just think like that, that idea that, that you'd make a film and it was just meant to be fun and you wouldn't worry about how it was received. It's like, we're just going to throw this out there. The most expensive Australian film ever made, uh, which is a great, I mean, that's a great tagline in, in of itself. And the tagline, when I saw that tagline as well, um, <laughs> uh, that I read out at the beginning, I thought, yeah, I think I'll, I think I'll enjoy this. But then sometimes some films don't land for me. I've seen a lot of love for Night of the Roxbury, and I think that's probably because it's kind of an American thing, but oh, I couldn't stand that. I thought it was the most stupid thing I've ever seen. And just couldn't get away with it. So I can understand how some people would watch this film and have the reaction I had to the Night of the Rock Street of this is stupid, it's insulting, it's awful. I, I don't, I don't want to watch it. I get that. I some like the Fifth Element, which has been on the Defend It Yourself series. I, I couldn't rewatch that for the series. It's the only film so far I haven't rewatched. I couldn't. I watched it once, hated it, tried to rewatch it again the day of the recording, um, got five minutes in, it was like nope, nope. I'll, I'll watch something else instead that I've seen a million times. So, yeah, but I, I genuinely, I genuinely really, really enjoyed this. Is there any other points you had? I've no doubt lords because I've banged <laughs> I, I, I think generally it's just one of those things where this film, like, if you were to sit and watch it right now, considering all the films that are out there these days, this film feels like a tonic, right? It's it's almost like a cleanse. It, you're not getting serious. You're not, you know, dealing with, you know, characters with deep seated issues kind of thing. It, it's, it's a goofy fun hour and a half, yeah. like in all honesty. And sometimes that is the best tonic for yeah. anything in the day. Yeah. It's a crap day film. That's what it is. That's what this yeah. is. I've often said on this podcast quite a few times, this is not a breakup film. Go watch it if you've had a bad day. This is the antithesis. This is the antidote to that kind of film uh, and a bad day. This this film, watch something like this. It's 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 very it's a little bit kind of like it's not as good as so don't kick off anybody. But it's a little bit like a uh, clue. I've seen the film Clue? Oh, I love Li Clue. Yeah, Clue yeah, is so good. Yeah, great, isn't it? And it's 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 a little bit like that. Like it knows what it is and it just goes for it it absolutely like literally almost like in the pirates film where they're making frederick walk the plank well not walk the plank getting that little bought the plank and he just it decides part with i'm just gonna do like an olympic dive off it i was like yeah, that's exactly what this film is every other film would have them walking down the plank looking all looking all morose with the hands tied together this film's like now nah, we're just gonna have the guy just beautifully olympic dive off the end beautiful entry 10 out of 10 and yeah, that, that's what this film is. And you're either you're either with it or you're not. And if you're not with it, it'd be a rough ride, rough seas. <laughs> Sorry, I can't help it. And if you are with it, smooth sailing. I, I'm not going to do any more. I promise. <laughs> 
Uh, oh, Captain, my Captain, you did very well on that one. Thank you very much. Oh, <laughs> nice. Um, so yeah, the wind's in the right direction. No, I'm not doing, not doing any more. I'm not doing any more. <laughs> not doing any more. Uh, because my wooden legs got to sleep. No, I'm joking. That sounds no. wrong. That sounds really wrong. <laughs> that sounds really bad. That does not, not come across how many. Um, <laughs> Ahoy, see, I see tell what, you, ahoy. Uh, <laughs> you see what happens when you, you stretch out these jokes too much? Uh, right. It's dad jokes and bad jokes for days. Not even a dad. Not even a dad. I, can't, I'm, I shouldn't be allowed <laughs> to get away with it. Uh, yeah. But no, I, I've I had an absolute blast, years. And would you um, like to tell everybody uh, where they can find your podcast and what you guys do over there? Because it's. Okay, so th there's actually two podcasts. The first one is It's Not That Bad, and we talked about that earlier in the show, where we will sit there and defend the unfairly maligned films. That We joke around that on Rotten Tomatoes, if the tomato is green, the movie can be seen. So we'll watch the film, and we will defend it and try to find the good things to say about it. I mean, we'll call a spade a spade. We'll, we'll say when the movie's bad, it's bad, but we will try to find the good things to say about it and prove that it's not as bad as its critic score. However, if you're a music fan, uh, there's also a podcast called There Can Only Be One, where we'll sit there and we'll go through the entire studio discography of an artist only picking one song from every album and making our playlist out of that. So if, an, if a band has 10 albums, we're making a 10 song playlist, one from every studio album. So for It's Not That Bad, you can find us on Twitter at Not That Bad Cast. For, only, for There Can Only Be One, you can find us on Twitter at Only One Cast. And you can find everything over on our website at NotThatBadCast.com. Nicely done. Nicely done. I was just thinking I've I've seen that um there can only be one pop up on Twitter and I thought it was like a, a Highland movie review thing. <laughs> no, there can only be one. There can only be one. <laughs> we, we 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 referenced that in the first episode. We we got everyone to get their Highlander references out there. Yeah, Although that being way. said, when we do the Queen sound or the Queen episode, you know we're gonna have to talk about Highlander. Yeah, absolutely. Oh cracking. Oh god, about the Rolling Stones one's gonna be a bit of a chore, isn't it? I, I had a friend of mine who said, hey, let's do Elton John. And then I took a look at the discography and oh, like wow. 30 no, plus no, no, albums. No. no, that that would literally be the uh, the Zack Snyder version of a podcast. <laughs> like, yeah, or a Martin Scorsese short film. Yeah, I mean, what you can do. Right. <laughs> what you can do. But no, thanks for coming on. Uh, I've, I've had an absolute blast. And as ever with my podcast, it goes all over the place. Uh, if you'd like to come back on, uh, for a regular review of your episode, you're more than welcome. If you'd like to come back and defend something else, please do, because I, lo I love this oh, series. Dude, so sign, sign me up. I got tons. Oh, I look forward to it. Uh, thank you, for Jason, for coming on. Uh, anybody uh, anybody, anybody there, you're listening to a review of yourself, uh, the podcast with the sigh. No politics, no pandering, no point. And you can catch us wherever you can get your podcasts. I'm not a great fan of doing this bit. We're on Twitter. It's at yourself review. We're on Instagram. It's uh, it's review yourself podcast 2021. And we also have a Patreon. Go and have a look at that if you fancy it. If you don't, no bother. Cheers to listening, everyone. Cheers, Jason. Get it in. Get it on. And enjoy the vlog. Welcome to Film Vloggers. Oh, harder, Daddy. The only film review podcast, thankfully, that poses the question, does watching this film feel like flogging a dead horse? There he is, beating that dead horse! Introducing your hosts. First up, her Irish potty mouth turns the air a whole new shade of blue. It's Fiona. Say hello, Fiona. And why the f*** is Dan Macca's doing our intro? I want me gold! That's great. It's great. She's adorable. And your second host needs no introduction. The man, the myth, the legend. Like, I said I'd do this. I said I'd do this for you. I'm not reading this. It's the guy who waffles too much. It's Ben. Cooey! I'm making waffles. So what are you waiting for? Grab your whip, mount your dead horse, and let's get on with the flog, shall we?